It's good to be in the house of the Lord again, isn't it? And you're all decked out in your colors. Blue, my favorite color. Glory to God. Most of you are. Yes, so if we were to give points for wearing the color, most of you would get some points and prizes. Any prizes for the colors, Uncle Sherman? Any prizes for the colors? No prizes for those wearing blue? All right, you've answered the call. Requested last week that you wear blue and um, you have worn blue in your hair and your colors. All right, I'm, I just have a little bit more time, so please um, bear with me. You have been sitting for a while. I don't know if you want to stand up and just stretch your body so that you can um, go with me until about 3 o'clock. All right, so I want to make sure that you have the energy. Um, they say that if you eat two bananas, that will give you a lot of energy. I don't know if there's any bananas here, um, but you'll have to. I'll try my best to keep you with me, all right? So just stay the course, stick in there. I want to just um, really speak about the Easter convention that I just finished. You know, just a little. I mean, really, the, the youth, the youth convention, even though we had to watch it, was really enjoyable. You know, I mean, especially that quiz section and that puzzle section was really good to see them traveling all over Jamaica. And we get to find out, I mean, where exactly are some of these churches, virgin churches um, in Jamaica. It was really good. Um, the other convention, I really, really, it was very inspiring. Our brother's message, our brother from, brother John Fraser, was really, really good. And it was also great to see a galleon participating in that, in that service, our brother Ronald, that was a wonderful poem. You know, indeed, that was a wonderful poem, and I really enjoyed it. And of course, um, Children's Convention, we was on Zoom. I had the opportunity of being the moderator. Boy, it was a lot of work put into it, and I am truly grateful that we were able to get it off. And it was so watchable. Well, we'll, be trying, we'll try our best to get it on YouTube. And, um, of course, you'll be able to watch some sections of it. But it was really interesting and good to see the galleons participate. This item you just see had the experience of seeing it live on Zoom um, at our convention. I want to say thanks to all those who participated, those who helped us to put it all together. Truly, galleons had a big part to play in it. And... Um, all thanks to the Galleons who worked hard to make it work. This morning, I want to talk to you. You know, sometimes we, when you see these trucks, these company vehicles pass by, they have at the back or on the bus, they have on it, how is my driving? You know, and um, the question I want to ask today is, how is your living? How are you living your life? Question. And we want to speak to you this morning on how we should live our lives. I mean, no doubt what we are using, the, the text we are using or what we are using in order to validate what we are saying is the word of God. Amen? And uh, um, this morning, I hope you have pen and paper because we have a little... Um, activity at the end that I'd like you to participate in. Of course, there's an old saying that says, see me is one thing, and to come and live with me is another, right? We, we, we know about it. Yeah, how we, how we live, how we live with each other, how we are able to cope with each other. So if you're married, you must understand what this means, right? You get married to the person, and of course, after a while, you realize that so it's not the person I was dating. Somebody different. Right, Sister White? Yeah, come on, man. Married people, yeah, true. If you are a landlord, you must understand what this means. If you invite somebody in your house to live with you, you realize that it is not somebody that you actually raised. So the person is different. Living is different. 
If you accommodate relatives from a different household, you will understand exactly what that means. See with me? It's one thing, and come and live with me is another thing. Of course, we have an idea of how we should live, right? Whether we are Christians or non-Christians, we are being socialized in a way as to how we should live. It's very important. We even have some desires of how we want to live too. We have a picture of how we should be living our lives. But is that lining up with God's intended plan for your life? God's plan was intentional. It's intentional. And it's intentional in a way that in his words, he shows how we should live. The word of God shows us how we should live. And that's the point of our information this morning. We're going to use the word of God to express and to show how we should live. So let's look at a couple of passages. Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Colossians chapter 1 verse 10 says, So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in knowledge, in the knowledge of God. He has told you, and this is from Micah 6 verse 8, He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God. Then we have Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 to 32 and I'm going to read it. This is from the English Standard Version. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you Along with all malice, be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And we pray, Lord, that you will just lead us in such a way, dear Lord, that this morning we'll understand clearly how it is that you want us to live our lives, living it for you. So, Father, we ask you to take all the glory. Lord, prepare our hearts to be receptive to your word this morning. So, Lord, you will be glorified in all we do and all we say. In Jesus' name. Amen. Indeed, when we read the word of God, it changes our lives. Because, indeed, it is our manual to live. So, therefore, this morning, we want to use it and apply it to our lives as much as possible. So as we look at this final passage that we looked at, let's break it down a little. Let's break it down a little. Let's, let's find out exactly what it's saying to us. Let no corrupt talk come out of our mouths. What comes out of our mouth? How, how do we speak? What is it that we say that defines us? Is all that the things that come out of our mouth, are they uplifting? Are they corrupt? Are they things to build strife and anger? 
You know, what comes out of our mouth is a representation of what's in our heart. Are we always quarreling? It's very important. What's in our heart? Because whatever is in our heart, that's going to come out on the outside. The word is telling us, let no corrupt talk come out of our mouth. Then it says, but only such as is good for building up. So therefore, we're giving, it's not just saying, don't let the corrupt things come out of your mouth. The word actually tells us what should come out of our mouth. Whatever we say, it should be building up others. And it should be suitable, it should fit the occasion. Tell me. Which is much difficult to deal with? Something that you say or something that you thought about that didn't say? Something that you say or something that you thought about but you didn't say? Which is worse? Right? Something that you? Something that you say. I will agree with that. Because what you don't say, nobody has heard it. But guess what? God knows what's in your heart. So you have to fix that part. Amen? But whatever we say, we have to be careful what we say. And sometimes, sometimes we say it at the wrong time. It don't fit the occasion. Because the word says that it may give grace to those who hear. So don't bother say it. Is it going to give grace? Is it going to uplift somebody? Is it going to encourage somebody? We have to watch what our tongue says. This part we hear all the time. It says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. By whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Grieving the Holy Spirit. Let's look at what that says. It says, to grieve the Holy Spirit means to make sad or sorrowful. It means cause sorrow, pain, or distress. Note this, the Holy Spirit is not a thing. The Holy Spirit is a person. Let me say this again. The Holy Spirit is not a thing. The Holy Spirit is a person. And as people of God and are led by the Holy Spirit, it's very important that we do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't let the Holy Spirit be sad or sorrowful. Don't let... Don't cause pain because you're a child of God. You know him as your personal Lord and Savior. That means he's indwelling in you. So therefore, if he's indwelling in you, then he must come out. You know, we speak, you know, we act. But let's ask, what does make the Holy Spirit sorrowful? One, foul and abusive language makes the Holy Spirit sad. Verse 29 says, don't use foul or abusive language. The word used here, look how bad it is. The word used here speak of something that has gone rotten. And we know what, when something is rotten, we know what that means. It's gone. It means that we, we are not to be using obscene language, profanity, dirty stories, vulgarity that should not be named among us. Remember, we're talking about how we living. Number two, bitterness. Bitterness makes the Holy Spirit sad and sorrow. Are you bitter? Or when you speak, do you seem to be a bitter person? When you respond to a question, does it seem, do you, do you 
re respond in bitterness. This ought not to be named among us. You know, sad enough, some people just like to be mad. They like, to con they like conflicts and like arguing and fighting. You know anybody like that? Every time you talk to them, you say one little thing to them and you want to... <laughs> Their response... All right. Oh, no, no, Matthew, Matthew. We can talk about it afterwards. Yeah, great. You understand what I'm saying? The response of the person, most times, it's always, you know, hunger. We have to watch that. And if you know of anybody like that, you need to pray for them. You need to pray for them. Because that should not be named among us. And you know, when somebody is bitter, they really want to keep that to themselves. Everybody will know that they're bitter. You won't need to have to, you know, sit down with the person and counsel with them to find that out. Bitter persons always announce their bitterness. And they even spread it too. So if they're bitter, they're going to get you to be bitter. They may not even do it consciously, but the way they are because of what is within them. And you know we want to remove that and put the Holy Spirit there. And you know that the bitterness and the Holy Spirit cannot dwell there. Can't dwell together. So if we don't have enough of the Holy Spirit in us, we need to get more of it so that we can remove those things in our lives. That's a stumbling block. How can we solve this? We need to forgive. Because the, the, the bedrock or the pillar on which bitterness thrives is unforgiveness. And that's something you can try. Try to forgive. And when you forgive, I guarantee you that the bitterness will be gone. And then the Holy Spirit can take up the entire space. Number three, fits of rage and uncontrolled anger make the Holy Spirit sad and sorrowful. We're not going to let that control us. Because we want the Holy Spirit to live in us and radiate from us. So when the man see you walking way up the road and him see how oh, you're walking, he know he says, that is a child of God. Thy word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So therefore, they should see you and know that you are a child of God. Beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim the word. Not true? Yes, man. We don't, we don't not need to be people of rage. We need to be people of control, self-control. That's what the Holy Spirit does to us. Let's look at a little excerpt from um, Shakespeare. He says, look at all of us. Look, all of us have been hurt in life, but we have a choice as to how we react. We can be like the moneylender, Shylock in Shakespeare, the merchant of Venice, demanding our pound of flesh. We can say, they did this to me. Therefore, I will have my vengeance. Or we can believe God when he says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. It's very important that we use the word of God to guide us. 
Because if we use our own feelings and desires, I'm telling you, we go into destruction. Let's try this acronym. Think. T is, is it truthful? H, is it helpful? I, is it inspiring? N, is it necessary? And K, is it kind? The verse continues and it says, along with all malice. And you know, malice is badness. These days, um, when somebody calling up, talking to somebody, what oh, go on, bad man? Seem just a saying, but is it really good to be in malice? The word tells us to lay aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the world that we may grow thereby. You know, we need the good things to let us grow. And when we harbor malice in our hearts, it doesn't help us to grow. It doesn't help us to go. Remember earlier we asked the question, does the word of God really and truly speak to you? Does it challenge you? The word of God requires of us to make changes in our lives. Verse 32 says, Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Be kind. You see, we have, this is what the word tells us, and then it gives us what we need to do. So it examines us, and then after it examines us, it gives us the answers. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? That it shows us up, it asks us questions about our lives, and then it gives us the tools to live our lives. How are we living? The word tells us that we ought to be kind one to another, tender-hearted. So the, 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 the person who is very aggressive, the person who is having trouble with forgiveness, here the word tells us that we ought to forgive. We ought to be tender-hearted. A soft answer turns away wrath. We have to be careful what we do and what we say in the circumstance at the appointed time. You know, sometimes we have that inner voice that keeps sowing doubt in whatever we are experiencing. So I'm going to ask you right now, just to do this with me, if you have pen and paper, I want us to write this down. Covenant with yourselves to act this verse out daily. Ephesians 4, verse 32. I don't see the pens coming out. I want you to write. I want you to write. And I know even if it's not tomorrow, some other time you will see this. I don't want you to throw it away. I want you to write it on something, write in your Bible somewhere, where you know that you will deliberately see it. I want you to write with me. It says, today, April 24, 2022. And write your name. So, Garth Riley desires to be kind one to another. 
tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave me. And I want you to sign beside it. Don't let that inner voice tell you you don't need to do this. Don't let that inner voice tell you, boy, nobody write nothing. Memorize it. You know that whenever the inner voice says, boy, you know, say it's not something good coming. It's a lot of compromise there. We don't want to compromise. We want to do as the word says to us. And we want to make it deliberate. We want to do it today. We don't want to wait until any other time. We want to declare to him that I want, Lord, to be kind one to another. As a, as a child of God, you shouldn't find this hard to do. Because already the Holy Spirit is within you. We have been delivered from hard-heartedness. We should not have hard hearts as Christians. Our hearts should be soft, tender. You know when you eat that KFC chicken and you bite and everything just go in your mouth like that? All right, you don't eat KFC. Mama's chicken. And it's just so tender. Our hearts need to be tender as believers. And if you are here and you're not a Christian, then in order for you to have this tender heartedness, tender heartedness, you need to accept Christ as your personal Savior. Because when you do that, the state of your heart is changed. And the Lord have his way and he's able to work in your life. We need to be obedient to the call. It may be difficult for you to make that decision. But this morning, we're inviting you to say yes to Jesus. We're going we're gonna to pray. And first we're going to pray for believers who think they really need to live out this verse. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I'm going to pray because the Lord knows. The Lord knows that we need to live out this verse. And if you are not living out this verse, he knows. So join me in prayer if you're a believer. Father, we thank you for today. And Lord, I'm coming to you right now because I, Lord, want to live out Ephesians 4, verse 32 daily. I want to be kind I want to be tender-hearted, Lord. I don't just want to say it. I want the Holy Spirit to speak through my life each day. Lord, help me to forgive. And Lord, you show the example of forgiveness. And Lord, I want to take your example of forgiveness to help me to know how to forgive. Father, I thank you for what you will do for my life from this day henceforth. And Father, I really and truly want to live this verse out. Help me daily, Lord. Lord, check me whenever I am not. Lord, give me that desire to want to please you more and more each day. And Lord, don't let me fail. Help me, Lord. Help me. I need your help now. 
Because living out this verse, Lord, it's going to be difficult, I must say, Lord. But with you in my life, with you there, I am able to do so. So, Lord, help me to remain in you so that you can radiate out of me. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. And if you are here and you are not a Christian, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Father God, I recognize that I am a sinner. And Lord, I want to live this verse out. Today, Lord, I want to accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. I don't want you to be somebody who is bitter. I don't want to be somebody who carries malice in my life. I want to live a life that is pleasing to you. So Lord, I accept it, that you died on the cross for my sin. And you didn't stay there, you rose from the dead. And Lord, you removed all my sins. So even now, Lord, I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. Amen. If you said that prayer, and if you meant it, don't leave here without talking to somebody. I'll be here right at the front. Don't leave here without having a word. You can come and say, I said that prayer, and I mean it, and I want to accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. I'll share with you. Let's have a final word of prayer. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. And we ask, dear Lord, that you continue to encourage us as we seek to live for you each day. Lord, we want to live for you. Help us through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everyone just say the truth.